Hi, I'm Connor Byrne, and this is That's What I Call Marketing, the podcast we do here from the leading lights in the marketing world and listen to their unique insights. Today, I'm joined by Mark Sands, Chief Innovation Officer at Diageo. I was at a session Mark held at the Marketing Leadership Masterclass, and afterwards, I asked if he would be a guest on the show as he was just so fascinating, and he kindly agreed. It's fair to say Mark has been a trailblazer in the beverage industry and a connoisseur of innovative marketing strategies. With over 25 years at Diageo, Mark has been at the forefront of reshaping how global brands engage with their audiences. He's known for his strategic acumen, seamlessly blending traditional marketing wisdom with contemporary approaches. In our conversation today, we talk about his path to working in Diageo and share an unexpected moment of crossover there. We talk about the brave career moves he made that really opened up his world to not just new opportunities, but new ways of thinking. We talk about innovation at Diageo, how he approaches it, how he and the team stay focused, what the emerging trends are, and throughout you hear how Mark approaches being a leader. Before we get started, don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening or watching so you never miss an episode. And that's what I call marketing ever again. You can rate this and other episodes and follow us all over social by finding That's What I Call Marketing. Today's show is supported by The Indie List, the leader in providing you with easy access to hundreds of highly experienced marketers quickly and cost effectively. Visit theindielist.ie to speak to the Indie List team today. If you would like to reach an engaged community of marketing leaders, get in touch with That's What I Call Marketing to discuss sponsorship opportunities. Mark, thanks a million for joining me on That's What I Call Marketing. Great to have you here. Thanks very much for having me, Connor. Well, listen, for for people who may not uh, know who you are just yet, uh, can you give an introduction to to Mark Sands? Absolutely. So uh, um, Mark Sands, I currently work at Diageo as Chief Innovation Officer. And uh, um, I've worked in Diageo for a long time now. I joined as a graduate trainee in 1997. Um, and one of the things I've realized is that as I say that to the graduate trainees who join these days, their response tends to be, oh, that's before I was born. Um, <laughs> I noticed that it's now going to feature um, uh, in this uh, series of The Crown because my first day at work was the day after Princess Diana died. So um, oh, wow. the, uh, uh, that puts it in its kind of historical context back then. Um, that was uh, in London. I grew up in London, in, in West London, and I joined actually what was the Guinness PLC business in West London at that stage. But a few months later, that merged with Grand Met to form Diageo. And I've been with Diageo ever since in a variety of different roles around the world in commercial marketing and now innovation as well. Amazing. Well, listen, a, a interesting, unexpected connection between when you started in your your career and that Princess Diana story, I was actually working. I did hospitality management in college. I was working on a work placement in the Guinness factory in Dublin, in James's Gate at that time. In, in terms when, of really I, fantastic. I remember you saying to me that you'd worked in, um, uh, yeah. in James's Gate before. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. In, in totally different, you know, washing pots in the kitchen. Yeah. That's <laughs> That's what I would do, but I, I can always say I can put Guinness on my CV. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that canteen is a, uh, it's a special place as, as you know, it would have been the case in 97. It's still the case now. We have all of our Guinness pensioners come yes. in for a free lunch and it's a, it yeah. creates this lovely environment where um, uh, every day, you know, people who'd worked in the brewery all their lives come in from wearing their jacket and tie and sit amongst uh, yeah. the em- employees uh, um, still enjoying their free lunch as employees do. Yeah, no, it was br- brilliant. Uh, I loved that. And then I also loved the the walkway under yeah. James's street so you could go in and because there was a house the other side of the road that um, senior executives would, would have stayed in. We used to go over and kind of be be downstairs to the upstairs. Fantastic. Yeah, those th- that network of tunnels is amazing. It's one of the great sort of well-kept secrets about the uh, about the site. Isn't it? It's brilliant. Listen, and I know you've Irish heritage and, and roots. So was Guinness always part of, of the plan with, with that in the background? Or how did you end up in that kind of grad program? Yeah, you, uh, you're absolutely right. So my, uh, uh, my grandparents on my dad's side were both born in Ireland. Uh, my granddad was born in Roscommon and... Uh, uh, my grandmother was from Tralee, 
And then they'd moved over across to London in the mid kind of 1930s or so. And my granddad was uh, an Irish doctor and he started practicing as uh, a GP in West London at the time that the Guinness Brewery was being built in West London. So he knew some of the people uh, involved, um, they knew he was Irish. And so they invited him to be the doctor covering the brewery uh, okay. at St. James, uh, at, not St. James Gate, at Park Royal in, uh, in West London. And then my dad, when he left school, uh, aged 18, started off working at uh, the brewery. His first job was the sports captain, because at the time, Guinness employed so many people. They had a tennis team, a football team, a cricket team, and they needed somebody yeah. to come and organize this. And 43 years later, my dad retired. Um, having gone from that to then working in the brewery and working in the sales teams and, and so on. And about five years before he retired, I then started on the graduate scheme. So if you put the three of us together, we have an unbroken lineage of about, us. what's that? I think we're 88 years or so. Um, wow. But the thing is, when I was growing up, that wasn't the plan. I hadn't decided, right, mm. okay, this is where I want to end up. In fact, if anything, I was maybe feeling... A bit like that, that was kind of the last place that I'd want to work. I'd right. want to go and do something yeah, else. Yeah. But I, um, I, I, studied, uh, I studied English and French literature at university. And uh, I, often people think that sounds a bit weird. But actually, I'm a big believer. I now have university-aged children. I'm a big believer in studying um, something that's going to teach you how to think and something you really enjoy as yeah. well so that you're going to get out of bed and go to lectures uh, and so on. And in a funny kind of way, I do think it's been really relevant to my career because each week I'd have to take a lot of information and condense it into a logical argument. Yeah. And that's what I do at work a, a, a lot. But as part of that course, my third year uh, was in France and I had to, I, I could go and teach in a school or I could find a job for myself. And I, I managed to get a, an internship. Unilever in Paris. And oh, wow. really my intention in doing that was to speak French for the year, but actually it got me into understanding marketing and getting an interest in marketing. And so when I finished university, I, I did a, a number of the graduate recruitment processes and Guinness just felt right. And I suppose it felt right because I'd grown up hearing all these stories about Guinness, um, the dinner yeah. table and having a kind of feel for what Guinness was all about. And so uh, I ended up starting there um, in 97. That's amazing. And was that your first then, the, that job in France, was that your first kind of foray into marketing? You Because I talked to obviously a lot of people for this and some people are like, I remember when I watched like the Levi's ad and that was my moment. Were you, you weren't that? You were kind of more... No, you found it, it was uh, almost accidental. Yeah, that was my uh, 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 that was my accidental route into marketing at that stage. When I left university, I had a, a year when I was working a little bit whilst in uh, um, applying for roles, and I worked for six months for a PR agency at that time. And actually, even at that stage, as the kind of you know the real bottom rung of a PR agency, <laughs> yeah. I learned so much stuff that I, I has stood me in good stead as a client of uh, watching what good clients do and what bad clients do. And that was a really useful um, perspective. But, uh, but yeah, no, I, I think when I was younger, I toyed with the idea of teaching. I toyed with the idea of uh, being a lawyer. And uh, I'd never particularly decided to go down that path. That's funny. And I've talked to a few people as well who who were lawyers, like Andy Nairn from Lucky Generals well, was actually a really? lawyer. And yeah, yeah. Like I just think anyway, we all come from different different ways, or we go straight into it. Like it's it's a great thing about this profession, I think, is that you can you can end up in it, um, or you can plan to be in it. And you can still if you're if you're curious enough, you can still have a, you know, wonderful career and learn everything about it. You had a lot of you've had a lot of different roles in Diageo. I guess over that time and the different roles you've had, um, this is quite a lofty question, but like in terms of your beliefs on marketing, how have you seen them change and evolve over that period of time and kind of the different roles that you've had? Well, God, that is a good question. I, uh, one of my beliefs is to always be learning. 
and uh, and therefore, uh, I, if I when I was kind of preparing for this, I was thinking about what do I do now that's learning, and you know, we're so lucky. There's so much brilliant stuff available to listen to, to read, uh, and to understand the science of marketing in a way that yeah. maybe wasn't as a, as available when I was starting out. But but there's so many different ways in which you can be learning. I, for me, one of the best bits of advice that I got was to always be stepping out of my comfort zone with each next new role that I was doing. Okay. And I think I only started following that advice about eight, 10 years into my career. I was just kind of, I was working in Diageo in Great Britain. I'd worked on the Guinness brands and then I'd moved on to work on Gordon's in, uh, in Great Britain. And I felt like Great Britain was the world. Right. Surely we were the best marketers in the company and probably the world. And, you know, I didn't need to learn anything new. And uh, there was a point that came up when there were, there were two jobs that had come up that would have both been promotions, one of them in the GB business and one of them right. which would have involved uh, moving overseas, moving to Ireland and joining one of the global teams. And I was really clear which one I was going for because I knew everybody in GB. I knew all the customers, and uh, and, and I suppose it felt kind of safe. And yeah. uh, somebody, uh, uh, somebody who you and I both know, Sil Salah, um, oh, yeah. took me aside and uh, said, "No, you're absolutely mad. Um, uh, I, this will uh, take the other path, and it will open up your thinking, and it will open up the world for you." And I was so glad as I look back, uh, I, I did that and. There are so many reasons why I could have said no at that stage. I had two young children, uh, and so that desire to stay close to family who were predominantly in London um, was very present. And uh, as I say, it kind of felt safe in my world. And I learned immediately an awful lot through the process of moving. Um, you know, I, I feel very close to Ireland. I did it as I was growing up, um, but, but being away from London... Dublin's different as no yeah. well now, and we uh, and we love it um, here. Um, and also moving into from a kind of frontline delivery role in marketing to then a global brand team role that's much more about the, the earlier stages of marketing of positioning, um, innovation, strategy, and with the luxury to look a bit further ahead and therefore be looking at what are the big consumer macro trends and looking across the world to see where are the common themes across markets and where are markets genuinely different and individual from different. each other. So just taught me an enormous amount of different stuff. And one of the things I now say to young marketers in Diageo is that at some stage in their career, they should do both of those things. Ideally be a marketing director in a country and a global brand director, because the two jobs are, are really different from each other. But if you put them together, then, uh, it's the, the full experience. They, they sound similar, don't, you know, don't they? You know, kind of, you know, but as you say, it's looking at very different challenges and, and things that you need to fi figure out, which is, which is where the, the learning, the learning comes, comes from, right? And, and actually, I think sometimes when we get it wrong, it's when people try to do those two different jobs the same way and they end up treading yeah. on each other's toes or um, uh, duplicating. Um, so... That experience gave us a little bit of confidence as a family. And by that stage, we'd had another two kids. Um, okay. And so at this point, with four kids under the age of five, I was then thinking about, okay, what's, what's the next job? And we'd always, when we came to Dublin, which is in 2005, we'd always thought, okay, we'll be away for two, three years, and then we'll come back to London. And actually, we, we became a bit more adventurous over those few years that we were in Dublin. And so my next job was then in Moscow as marketing director for Diageo for Russia and Eastern yeah. Europe, this amazing collection of, of countries. And um, we moved there as a family. Uh, my, uh, my wife was doing the school run, pushing two kids in a double buggy and pulling the other two on sledges over the snow. I mean, it was, um, and we lived in this just incredible environment, a sort of like a, a gated community, uh, there was like a, a big village with 
some expat workers from the big companies around the world, a lot of oil workers um, there, some wealthy Russians. We had three Brazilian footballers who had signed for Dinamo Moscow, who lived there with their families. Oh, wow. um, some American diplomats who were probably spies, a nonsense <laughs> who'd come in to join the Bolshoi Ballet. And as soon as she came in the gates, it was this great leveler of everyone was yeah. in the, everyone was on equal terms. It was very social. I mean, partly because nobody came to visit. So, you know, you, you relied on everybody uh, else around you. And it, it was a magical time in our, our, our lives. Um, but work-wise, it was also absolutely fascinating because Diageo had only opened a business in Russia two years before. Before that, we'd been operating through a distributor. So you had okay. this kind of startup feeling, hiring a lot of people, um, trying to figure out how to shape um, the industry, um, and which you know was still in a, a relatively sort of immature um, uh, stage uh, of the industry. And through incredibly volatile times, I went there in 2008. Yeah. We were growing 40%. Then financial crisis hit Russia and we were declining 40%. And um, then within a year, we were sort of back up. And it was an incredible learning process that of managing through that. It, it was like having 10 years of experience condensed into one. And right. I really drew on that experience managing through crises like COVID. It, I, I could really remember back mm. to that sense of, okay, this feels terrible now, but if we keep an eye on what the future is going to be, um, then we can make a lot of positive change, um, uh, uh, provided that we stay on track with the, um, the longer-term vision. Yeah. Uh, how did you, I mean, that's such a fascinating one to kind of go into Russia and obviously looking after the market. How did you kind of start getting insights to, to start to understand the market? Because like wildly different, I imagine, to you know, where you'd operated before, but were there a lot of, were there similarities you were able to pick out kind of consumer behavior or insights? De definitely similarities. But I think one of the traps um, when people go overseas is trying to look through the the lens of what you know. Um, yeah. And actually, I, I was glad in a way that I'd gone somewhere that was so different where the language was different, where the alphabet was different, um, retail <laughs> structure was different, and, and therefore it really forced me to learn properly. And that learning came, I suppose, there probably wasn't as much data available at that stage. We had kind yeah. of Nielsen data, but we didn't have the same depth of consumer data that we now have. Um, so I spent a lot of time out in trade, um, speaking to customers, listening to consumers, I remember this one amazing workshop. It's one of the best learning experiences I, I, I've had of um, a, a team of us from the Russia business, from some of the other Eastern Europe countries, and a couple of our global colleagues did a workshop to lay out what were the future white spaces where of the portfolio that we wanted to participate in. Yeah, And we were in uh, a, a meeting room for day one, and then for the evening, we were all paired up with uh, Russians to go and explore different occasions. Um, so myself and uh, uh, one of my colleagues from the strategy department went to uh, a house party in the outskirts of Moscow. And um, I, I, the people there didn't exactly know what we were there for. Um, and they just welcomed us in and, uh, and we chatted to them. Um, and I mean, well, my boss was sat on a park bench with uh, a, a couple of guys who would go and sit in the park and uh, have a few drinks together. And all of it was about letting us walk in the shoes of the consumer. Yeah. And we came back then for day three, everybody buzzing with the experiences that they'd had. And it just brought a different insight. And that, that workshop yeah. paved the way for launching some Diageo brands that existed in other parts of the world um, that weren't yet in Russia, but also kicking off some new to world brands that we felt we needed to create to um, uh, uh, play in some spaces that were particularly for that market. Oh, it's amazing. Do you think we do enough of that still? Like, do we rely too much on the spreadsheet data and miss out on the sitting beside the customer? 
I think there's definitely a risk of that. I mean, and clearly the the quality of the spreadsheet data is so much better than it used to be. And yeah. you, you can learn so much from that. But I do really value um, touching and feeling things and seeing it. Um, it's one of the things that I'm so lucky about in my job. I get to travel around the world a lot. And the experiences of um, being in bars in different places around the world and being in our distilleries, um, I, I find it, it does something that the data can't do, which is uh, it helps top up your gut feeling. Sometimes yes. that can sound a yeah. bit dangerous as a marketer because it might maybe then you're just relying on your biases. You know, confirmation bias. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do believe there's something important about it of that over time you get a sense of feel for what's right for your brand, what's what's not right for your brand. Um, and also where you can can spot different things that are, are, are happening. Um, I, re I really remember in um, jumping back a little bit, 1999, I was in Edinburgh and I was doing a, we were preparing for Guinness sponsoring the Rugby World Cup of that year. And okay. we're going round all of the main pubs that um, rugby supporters visit on their way to Murrayfield and seeing how we would partner with them in preparation for the Rugby World Cup. And during that day, myself and um, the local sales manager for Scotland noticed this weird thing there were lots of people drinking gin and tonic with cucumber in it. Um, and what was happening was it was um, the first month of the test market for Hendrix. Um, and uh, this hadn't come up in any of our data. We hadn't seen any um, kind of announcement of this new brand, um, but we, uh, we, we just kind of saw it happening. And um, uh, it's one of the things that I always remind myself when it's been when it's been a little while before I've actually been out and looked at things uh, uh, differently, that there's there's always something new to learn out there. Yeah, I'm, gosh, I remember the cucumber and it was everywhere then. Yes, <laughs> like you know, you, you weren't like you weren't having a proper gin unless there was a cucumber in it. <laughs> Fascinating stuff. Um, one question I did want to ask you about because there's a lot of you know stuff we've talked about there, kind of the, you know the inside and kind of thinking about global and. I know something like that, you know, the dweeb is, is a very uh, important part of how Diageo goes about its planning. How has that evolved and changed over, over time? Because, um, you know, again, I've, I've been exposed to it a, a couple of times, but I know it, it's continuing to evolve. Like, is it, has it, does it take things that come out like the long and short of it and reflect it into the dweeb? I'd love to just kind of understand it without giving away the secret sauce going behind the, the gates of Willy Wonka's factory. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It does. We're actually in the process of rolling out the most updated version. It's gone through another okay. um, evolution, which happens every few years. I think we're calling this dweeb 4.0. Um, okay. I first did it in the year 2000 and um, it was probably the foundational learning of marketing that I did. As I look back now, there were some brilliant things in that first week, but there are also some things that we know now weren't right. Um, and things right. like the long and the short of it, um, and also how brands grow by Bar and Sharp, you know, that's really informed um, a new section that we have at the start of it, which are kind of like our, our dweeb philosophy. Um, of uh, uh, essentially the principles uh, that drive brand growth. One of the things that's always been true about Dweeb um, is that it's not just for marketers, uh, uh, that it's a business philosophy rather than just a marketing philosophy. And therefore, we get our managing directors to, um, to go through it. We get our finance directors to go through it uh, uh, as well. Okay. Um, and I think that's one of the really special bits about it because it helps to ensure um, that everyone views marketing properly, views it as a driver of growth and of profit rather than as a cost. Um, and right. uh, I, I, and it, it's important that it's not just the marketing team saying that. It needs to be something that's, um, uh, that's understood by the, the whole of the business. And of course, the, a number of the tactics and the implementations that are in Dweeb have of course changed so much over the years as uh, the the channels have evolved and yeah. social and digital have become much more important. 
really, really interesting. Such a wonderful point that you could have a planning or a way of planning, for want of a better word, it, you know, that sits within marketing an organization and actually drive so many decisions, so many things, but nobody outside of marketing gets exposed to it. That happens in so many places. Or at best, it's a presentation yes. to a group of people saying, this is how we approach marketing. And people are like, oh, that's interesting, versus actually going through it and, and deeply understanding it. Deeply understanding it and having expectations of, um, uh, uh, of our, our colleagues to lead with it as well. Um, and, you know, whenever, whenever you get to the stage where there's a bit of performance pressure, um, you know, like any other company, there's, there's some tension points when the marketing team need to, need to demonstrate that they're, um, they're spending the money in the right way and that they are driving growth. Yeah. But again, those tools um, uh, through which we can measure that have improved over time. So we use something called Catalyst that is both a pre-planning tool that helps you choose where to spend your money and also how you should balance your portfolio in the right way to, to drive the most profitable outcome as well as also then being a, a retrospective view of looking at the performance of, of your campaigns and, uh, and seeing if they, they lived up to the goals that you were expecting. And I think that's really important for credibility as well as for finding the truth. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I think one of the cultural changes I've seen through data becoming more a part of the conversation is it's no longer... Maybe at one stage, how it was that the most persuasive voice in the room um, got yeah. the spend or or persuaded people that this was the right advertising copy. Um, mm. That is balanced now with um, the most inquisitive or the most curious um, uh, of people who are looking to uh, deliver the best outcome and aren't wedded to one solution for, uh, for what that is. Yeah, you, like... Uh, very good friend of mine, Paul Paul Durvin, who was leading the national lottery here in Ireland for a good time. He he would often talk about strong views lightly held, which I really yeah, like, I like. You know, because he's curious enough to be wrong, and I think that's you know. And I, do you think that comes with kind of the maybe as you go through your career? Because the younger you are, the more right you want to be. I think. Yeah, definitely, and uh, I, I I can see that um, evolution in in myself. Um, and it is important, you know, because one of the one of the roles that marketing play, maybe one of the lesser defined roles, is leading the business, um, leading it in terms of identifying where the future growth is going to come from, and also giving confidence and conviction behind the choices that we're making. And so, yeah. getting that balance right to be both open to be being wrong, um, constantly learning, but also giving confidence is. It's one of the difficult things. That a, a former Diageo president always used to say um, that leadership, were, uh, uh, the, the tone of leadership always had to be face reality, give hope. And actually, he was, he was the guy who was leading us through the financial crisis of 2008. And that kind of mantra really stuck with me. Um, and uh, I think there's so much in the way that we need to lead the business that relies on those two things. If you're too much one way or the other, so if you're too much facing reality and staying in the present, then um, the risk is you can kind of drag everyone down a little bit. It, it, it's yeah. important to um, to really recognize where you are, but also how you're going to make it better. And so having that balance between um, this is our position today and this is the future vision that we're building, getting the balance right between those two things is critical for marketers. Yeah, do I mean I say I say observing somebody doing that through through a financial crisis was phenomenal. You know, being able to kind of see how they did that because that was yeah the worst of times, right? Uh, oh, I would have said it's the worst of times that I'd worked through until we got to COVID, um, COVID yeah. and uh, without kind of directly taking exactly that same approach, our late great CEO at the time, Sir Ivan Menezes, uh, just set an unbelievable tone through um the way that we uh, approach covid uh, and for uh, for him it was all he he laid out uh, a desire for us to emerge stronger and and importantly not just for our business to emerge stronger he he said it was, had to be on four things um 
for our brands, for our customers, our retail customers, um, for our communities uh, as well, and for our employees. And uh, uh, there were so many of the things that we did during that period that were prompted by that that sense of, hang on a minute, how uh, how can we do things that will benefit those kind of four different perspectives of the uh, of the business, rather than just, for example, choosing to protect the profit line um, through COVID, which we yeah. could have done. It would have been a, a rational thing to do. There was something done with for publicans. I can't remember exactly what, but was it the all the stock was refunded or sent back and they got their money back? Am I That's right? right. We did two, two big things like that. One was, um, particularly from a Guinness perspective, COVID hit the majority of the world in the middle of March. And uh, at, at that stage, pretty much every pub in the world has bought additional Guinness for St. Patrick's Day. And so publicans, yeah. small business owners who were now shut down for the foreseeable future um, were sat on this stock that they'd paid for and they couldn't, uh, they couldn't sell. And we looked at uh, what are we going to do about this? And there was uh, a feasible thing that we could do to say, well, no, you've, you've bought that. Um, uh, it's your problem. We could also have extended the shelf life on it and said, okay, well, it's now, it's going to go out of date, but you can still sell it. Um, right. But, uh, and, you know, some of the other beer players did do that. Uh, but for us, that w crossed a couple of principles. It crossed the line of it's not really supporting our, our customers and it's just compromising quality as well. And so we took the decision of buying back all of that excess stock, uh, all of the stock that was sitting in, uh, in pubs around the world. I've worked on Guinness for a long time and there isn't. Uh, it's the single biggest expenditure we've ever had on Guinness, more than any ad, more than any sponsorship yes. that we've done. Um, and of course, the impact that it had for those small business owners, the, pub, uh, yeah. the pubs, um, was, uh, uh, was great. The other thing it meant was that then when we did have the, the reopening, um, uh, by that stage, the Guinness that people were tasting was the freshest Guinness they, they would have ever had. And actually, we made a real focus on sending out all of our quality teams, cleaning the lines, making it everything. Perfect, Getting it ready. So that the time that people returned to the, the, the pub, it was the best Guinness ever. And it was what people have been kind of longing for during that period. And I think both of those elements, the, the support from the customer and also um, the, the kind of longing for the perfect Guinness have really have resulted in Guinness now having this amazing um, period of growth coming out of uh, out of COVID. Today's show is brought to you by the Indie List CMO Collective. This service from the Indie List provides you with access to a curated range of highly experienced and talented senior marketing specialists. Visit the IndieList.ie to find out more. Yeah, number one beer in the UK. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, first time ever, number one beer in the in the on trade in the UK. Um, uh, uh, doing fantastically in Ireland, in, uh, in the UK, oh, in, uh, in Africa. <laughs> no, it's really a golden age um, for, for Guinness. And the other thing that we did after, if that was sort of at the start of COVID a little bit, as you know, I suppose we came out, we returned to pubs, and then, of course, we closed again. And, you know, we went through yeah. that period for a while. And it was clear that the on-trade around the world was, was going to be struggling financially a great deal. And so we, at that stage... When, when our, our p &L, the Diageo p &L, was under a huge amount of pressure, we invested a hundred million pounds, um, uh, into pubs and bars around the world. And that money was all about helping them to adapt to their new reality. For a lot of people, it was building outdoor space because either yeah. the regulations required that or consumers at that stage just felt more comfortable being outside. There was a lot about some of those practicalities of COVID of, sanitizer and um uh face masks and uh, and so on um but uh but again that's uh, the reason we did it was because we needed the on trade to be there when uh when everything oh, reopened yeah. and we we wanted to um ensure that those businesses were able to survive and it really changed the the nature of our relationship with the on trade during that period did did you look at um or did the team look at kind of the 
the consumer response to it in terms of like, you know, the, the brand health, like I, I'm guessing the stories about all those things helped the brand stay, you know, I guess even top of mind, but just improved if there was any improvement to be done, you know, the perceptions people had of, of Guinness as a, as a brand. It did. Um, and actually following that, um, following that through the whole COVID process, I'm sure you would have seen this as well, Connor. It, 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 it felt like the, the mood of the consumer, the mood of the public evolved a lot through the period. There was that initial period of shock and everyone at home, which if you remember also coincided with a, that, that bit of a sense of nature is healing and back to basics and um, mm. uh, spending time with family and, and so on. And some of the COVID advertising that happened at that stage was kind of all the same. Um, uh, 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 Yes. Everyone following the same sort of stereotypes at, at that period. Yeah. But as things moved on, um, we could we were tracking um, both kind of formal social listening, but also in just what we were looking at uh, um, uh, as we were following the way that people responded to Guinness. And you saw a bit more humor coming in um, in memes and so on are often memes about how people were longing for their Guinness. And yeah. we also saw this fascinating thing of the experiments that people were doing to try and get a better Guinness at home. So they included things like using uh, jewelry cleaners that sort of vibrate to <laughs> agitate yeah. their Guinness. Some, there was one video that sort of caught on a bit of somebody <laughs> using an electric toothbrush in his Guinness to vibrate. <laughs> and there is, there's some... There's some logic to this because um, Guinness uses nitrogen as the gas as opposed to carbon dioxide that um, uh, most other beers use. And nitrogen is a, uh, a more inert gas. It doesn't escape. And that's why you, um, uh, the creamy head stays with Guinness. And what makes the surge and settle in the creamy head is the nitrogen being activated as you pour it. So if you're yeah. in a pub... That comes because it gets forced through small holes, um, uh, 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 microscopic holes in the in the tap, and that's what kind of activates the nitrogen. Um, our cans that have a widget in, what that widget does is it activates the nitrogen, um, and ultimately, an electric toothbrush can also activate uh, nitrogen right. as well. And we saw all this fascination with what was happening, and of course, sales of Guinness and cans had gone up enormously. Yeah. But it prompted us into thinking, okay, we need to find a, 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 a better ways as well. Of, uh, uh, and the team brilliantly set themselves the goal of, uh, right, we need to find a new method of, of serving Guinness at home uh, to hit this time. And uh, our, our brilliant quality team, a guy called Steve Gilson, um, was, uh, was developing what became something called Guinness Nitro Surge. Yeah. In all this kind of distant working, um, uh, you know, he'd been meeting in uh, somebody in a car park to drop off uh, the prototypes of this new uh, uh, um, uh, this new um, technology, and we launched this um, uh, uh, kind of as we were coming out of COVID. Um, it, for those who haven't seen it, it's like a, a cap sits on a special can of Guinness, and so the liquid goes through the cap. An ultrasound pulses as you pour it, um, and that's what creates the surge and settle. I should have brought my nitro surge in to show yeah. everybody. <laughs> and, and you know, it uh, it works unbelievably well. The quality is fantastic. We um, we got an estimate. We launched in Ireland, and we got an estimate from our sales teams of how much we were going to sell over the next six months. The cap is made in China, so we took that estimate, doubled it got that stock in and we sold that stock out within five days of, of the launch. And then we're desperately scrabbling to try and get more, more stock yeah. over because it just took off. And in that first year in Ireland, one in five households in Ireland had a nitro surge um, in it. Um, and it, they're like the golden ticket going back to my Willy Wonka. Yeah, and other exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. Do you get one? And it taps into one of, one of the ways in which we're thinking about innovation now, because of course, it was a little bit more than just uh, a new liquid in a can. Um, yeah. And the way I would describe that, to what we're trying to do in innovation is platforms, not products. Um, meaning 
it's broader than just the new liquid. It's um, either the new business model or route to consumer or technology alongside it. That means that one platform can give birth to multiple products and therefore the innovation sustains for longer um, and is harder to copy for competitors. It becomes more distinctive as a result. Yeah, because I was going to ask you, this kind of was neatly bringing us into your, your current role. Um, and, and I've heard you talk about, you know, it's not, a, it's not necessarily a flavor. That may be a thing, but that's not going to be where you're going to significantly improve or gain a competitive advantage. You know, it's, it's a... So when you got into the role, what, you know, obviously you're in it a while now, but, you know, when you got into the role, what were you, what were you looking at? What were you seeing? And what kind of path did you want to bring the innovation team on? I it, it it was um a, such a great role because it covers all categories in Diageo, including the ones that we don't play in yet. It covers all the countries and it covers sort of this time horizon and also the future uh, as well. Um and the scale of that can feel a bit overwhelming uh, at times. Yeah. Yeah, I'm overwhelming yeah. hearing this. <laughs> And so one of the things that um, I was first doing as I went around and listened and I traveled out and met everybody was trying to find the themes and the structures that would allow us to focus in the right areas and also um, I, uh, deliver what Diageo needs us to, to deliver for now and, and for the future as well. And I had some, some words in my mind, particularly as I was starting off, that a great person called Guy Eskom had said to me once, Guy used to work in Diageo. He was the marketing director in China. And when I went to Russia, I touched base with him because he was living a similar kind of experience to me. And his advice to me was, your job isn't to tell the time, it's to build the clock. Meaning it's to create the systems so that when I'm not in the meeting, when I've moved on to a new job, um, that uh, the systems, the platforms that are generating the performance uh, are, are still in, in place. And uh, there's a couple of things that I would, uh, I'd kind of point to that we're, uh, that we're trying to do in innovation like that at the moment. One of them is this idea of platforms, not products. So broadening yeah. the scope of, uh, uh, of innovation. And a great example of that is something called What's Your Whiskey? Uh, that we developed and ultimately then acquired as well, started with a, a question of, do you think there's a way that we could predict people's whiskey choice based on their, their flavor preferences? And our, our research and development team started playing around with this for uh, a, a while and uh, came across a company called Vivanda who um, owned the, 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 and had developed the biggest database of flavor preferences in food in the world, and therefore had great understanding of algorithms of how to use this data. And together with our R&D team, they developed 10 simple questions, such as, do you like tropical fruit? Do you like spicy food? That based on your, the combination of your answers to those could predict very successfully what would be the right whiskey for you. This in itself, is really useful because for a lot of people, whiskey's a, a bit of a confusing category, maybe slightly intimidating. If you're paying, yeah. I don't know, 40, 50 pounds a bottle, there's quite a lot of risk involved in, uh, in that. So just as, a, uh, as a, a platform to get people to choose the right whiskey for them and feel like it was recommended, um, it's already uh, a, a good use. But what we found through this is Having developed this understanding and this platform, there's so many different ways in which we can use it. So we've just put "What's Your Beer" into the Open Gate Brewery in uh, uh, Guinness in Chicago and in Baltimore. Oh. Um, uh, we're developing that into other categories uh, uh, as well. And then the data that we get from this is fascinating and is allowing us to reshape both the innovation that we're going to be creating because we have a better understanding of. Um, the, 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 the real popular um, uh, uh, flavor preferences. We're also able to then share this data with our customers. And increasingly, we're working with them to reorganize the whiskey category in store 
based on this, um, these right. flavor preferences and this way of kind of decoding the category. God, that's fascinating, isn't it? Just like, and what seems like a very simple question to be asking people, right? Like, and it's going to do so much. How do you, like with that, and as you, you said, kind of it's, there's so much, it could become overwhelming, right? And you talked about the things you've had to put in place. How do you, how do you ensure that everybody is kept focused on the things that, things that matter? I mean, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, there's a couple of things we, we have firstly being clear about the, how the process works to, um, ideate and choose where we're going to be, um, uh, focusing our resources. And broadly, there's, there's kind of four big streams that feed into this. There's. Um, a look into the future. So we have uh, a, a fantastic um, uh, foresight model that we've developed that basically looks at what are going to be the big macro trends in, right. say, the year 2030. And it also allows us to see how those trends are evolving year by year. Um, and the way that people are talking about them, does that differ from country to country? And so you get this sense of what the big spaces are, spaces like um, wellness or neo-hedonism of uh, um, uh, indulgence and uh, pleasure-seeking. But you also get a sense of, okay, what's the way into that that I can use in this country right now? So great piece yeah. of consumer analysis that importantly is broader than our category. It is not, it's not about spirits or alcohol. It's about kind of consumer behavior first and, and foremost. And how, so how are you kind of keeping ahead of all that, though, you know, and kind of, you know, because, again, lots in there and even talking about wellness. I mean, the the zero part of the business has become, you know, is becoming bigger and bigger. And, you know, are you are you focused on innovating around that? And how is that working in, in spirits as well? I think that's probably more. Is it more challenging? Uh, it, it's the fastest growing segment of spirits in the world. Um, and it, it's amazing how quickly it, it has accelerated over the years. Um, we took our time to make sure that we could launch with great liquids, um, and yeah. the R and D teams created a uh, fantastic, uh, Tanqueray zero zero and Gordon zero zero first. Um, and then we subsequently, um, launched Captain Morgan zero zero as well. And of course, Guinness, um, but that time spent in getting the science right was really important. Um, and then. We've learned a lot about how best to communicate the benefits and what are the occasions to go after. And they're not the same everywhere. So for example, right. in Spain, there ex already exists a big non-alcoholic beer segment um, that people would often drink at lunchtime, say, for example. And therefore, the role of Tanqueray Zero Zero was to target non-alcoholic beer um, and uh, uh, find a way of kind of elevating um, consumer choice in, in that occasion. And it's been so successful. Tanqueray Zero Zero in Spain is around 15% of the size of the total um, Tanqueray uh, uh, trademark. So uh, right. uh, materially big. And then what's interesting is who is drinking it? Because what we see is that that cohort is more diverse, more female, um, uh, uh, around 90% incremental to um, the trademark and a lot of it incremental to the gin category as well. So um, uh, uh, makes for a great um, uh, selling proposition to our retail customers uh, uh, as well as a result. And that's really different from, say, in um, the UK where uh, Tanqueray and Gordon's have also been successful, but that non out beer segment wasn't as developed and therefore, yeah. um, the occasions that people are targeting there is um, uh, is people often alternating on a night out of um, uh, choosing right. to have a Tanqueray and tonic and then a Tanqueray Zero and, uh, and tonic and moderating in that way. Um, and both of those are different from what we expected at first. We thought it might be, you know, uh, try January or um, yeah, um, yeah. That, that, those periods when you're kind of totally um uh refraining from alcohol actually we see it much more um being consumed by people moderating isn't that interesting because you know i think it was always the thing it was like the this is a you know 
it's almost like a, I don't know, not a shameful thing, but you're like, oh, you're drinking a non-alcoholic something, you know, whereas now it's just like, you know, which do you want almost? It's not there yet, but it's it's certainly getting there. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. There's definitely a bit of social peer pressure. Um, we saw this uh, um, with the, the the campaign that we did of Guinness Clear. I don't know if you remember that one. Um, yes. At the insight behind that was we heard people saying that they were sometimes a bit embarrassed to ask for water when they were uh, on a night out and therefore weren't rehydrating as much as they should do because they felt like you know they'd, uh, their mates would pick up on it. And really what that campaign was about, where we made a, a, a kind of parody of a new launch of Guinness Clear, which was water. So good was creating a new vocabulary so that people could kind of, you know, wink and nudge and order a Guinness clear and get a water. And it just made it more socially acceptable. And uh, uh, the campaign was really fun and got good feedback. But the best thing about it was we could see in social listening that people were picking up this expression and yeah. uh, it had kind of given a language for it. Um, and we definitely see a similar thing happening in the, the, the non-alc space, um, which is why one of the one of the things that really helped us on that journey was um, that we had acquired through um, Distill Ventures, we'd acquired the brand Seedlip. And Seedlip had done a great job of establishing non alk spirits in the high end of the on-trade and given a lot more credibility behind the, uh, the segment. And all of the other brands that we have benefit from uh, that credibility. You touched there on acquisition. What what part does acquisition play in the overall innovation strategy? You know, is it part of kind of we could either go here and build this, or we can go and buy? Yeah, that uh, that question, build or buy, is uh, uh, is a really relevant one. Um, and we have a couple of different um, platforms for that. We have something called Distill Ventures, which I mentioned there, which is um, yeah. uh, it's been running for ten years now, and it's a way of investing in spirit startups and um we don't acquire all of them some of them will invest in and help them build and one of the uh the value exchanges that happens there is um it allows us to identify great entrepreneurs and great spirits propositions at an early stage and we can then bring some things that uh, the entrepreneurs would sometimes find difficult to do, whether it's access to IP lawyers, access to bonded warehouses, um, or uh, in some instances, some of the spirits brands that we work with are setting up um, visitor centers, and we can get the team from the Guinness okay. Storehouse to advise on um, learnings behind those and so on. Um, and uh, I, I always really enjoy that part of the business because what you're doing there is seeing the future um, through the lens of these kind of vibrant up and coming businesses. And then of course, over the years, we've had larger scale, um, uh, acquisition that's really benefited Diageo, such as the acquisition of Casamigos, uh, a, a few years ago from George Clooney and, uh, and his colleagues, which has had an incredible, uh, impact on the business, particularly in the U S. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, fascinating some of those kind of celeb driven we're seeing more and more celeb driven um you know alcohol, alcohol brands I, I think it's kind of interesting one isn't it? it's an interesting space because they're you know they're obviously elevating you know the, the alcohol brand through them through themselves uh fast tracking it is that part of me thinks is that unfair to some of these startup ventures that you're, you're involved with as well um i don't know if it's unfair um <laughs> I suppose they have their advantage. Yeah, that you should use. exactly. <laughs> I, the thing is, new to world brands are hard. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, it's you know one of the other reasons that we uh, that Distill Ventures is so good for us is because we're not good at doing brands from the start and when they're really small because they need nurturing, and they often need the founder to be personally involved, personally selling them to bars and to, uh, and to restaurants. Um, yeah. And of course, having a celebrity founder or a celebrity ambassador is a way of potentially accelerating through those difficult first few years and getting to scale quicker. Um, but of course, you look across the, the range of celebrity endorsements and celebrity owned brands, there are winners and losers in there. You still have to come yeah. back to the foundations of is the celebrity partnership true to the, uh, the brand? 
is the quality of the brand uh, right? And also, um, is the the price point and the hunting ground that the, the brand is playing in uh, an area that is going to be growing out into the future? And I, it was those kind of things that all came together with Casamigos for us. Is um, just talking to kind of the maybe the, the future, maybe some of the emerging trends. Like, is tequila going to be one of the big growth spirits, or is it still whiskey? Um, I, I can I. See? I forgot that completely. completely. Yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Tequila is um yeah, is going to be a, an enormous global growth phenomenon over the next few years. Um it's already happened in the US that um we've seen a, a huge growth, huge number of launches of uh, of new brands. Yeah. And um uh, and I think one of the things that marks out tequila as different from other spirits is it can be a white spirit that's mixed in cocktails um, and therefore operating in the space that vodka and gin often plays in, or it can be drunk over ice, neat and sipping and therefore play in the space that whiskey and cognac plays in as well. And it also allows a price ladder, the like of which really only exists in whiskey and maybe cognac as well. Um, and that's what makes it so attractive a, as a spirits category. But for a right. consumer, also gives so much exploration and so many spaces in which it can operate. Now, a lot of countries um, would have consumers saying, uh, oh, yeah, I had some tequila when I was young and I, uh, I did some tequila slammers in my 20s and so on. Um, and, uh, and that's not what the, this category is now yeah. at the moment. There's a whole new discovery phase that... Uh, um, that we can see happening across the world at the moment. Um, so, uh, yeah, tequila is definitely going to be a, a strong growth pro- prospect over the next few years. Yeah, I think, I, again, it's the it's the it's probably the repositioning of tequila from that, you know, student, you know, shot to actually something that's a, a more enjoyable, enjoyable drink. Um, I know we're coming close to the end. I have a couple more questions to ask you because I don't want to eat too much into your time. But, like, obviously, you, you're kind of, you own the innovation function in, in Diageo, huge. But where does innovation sit? Like, I, I kind of get the, the sense that it, it sits in all parts of, of Diageo. And how then, as the head of innovation, do you kind of corral it all together? That's right. I, I, no, there's, um, it's one of the great things about innovation that you do work across all the functions. And actually, for our innovation managers, they need to be great at the marketing part, concepting and design. Um, they need to be, um, uh, great at understanding the PL, how the supply chain works, uh, and also commercially how we're going to sell it. So you do get this great broad set, and all of those functions work um, with innovation and are critical in making innovation happen. Um, so it's important to have uh, uh, the, our strategic focus that comes from those foresight areas, comes from our understanding of consumer occasions, which are the growing occasions. And then also we have these five kind of forever goals in innovation of um, categories or business objectives that we're always going to be working on. Um, right. Categories like Scotch lend themselves to that a bit because often uh, I've got a meeting in January where we're choosing um, the experimental liquids that we're going to be putting into barrels, which will be a gift to my successor, maybe my successor's <laughs> successor when they come out of their barrels in 10 years' time. Um, uh, so that long-term planning and, um, uh, uh, and long-term exploration and R and D roadmaps, uh, are really important for a category like whiskey. And that same is true to a certain extent for tequila as well. We also look at that for, for Guinness, for in particular dispense of Guinness, you know, what's going to be the next wave of nitro surge and micro of, of yeah. how we can deliver the, the best pint of Guinness in the right way. But we also look at it for non-alc and more broadly into wellness, different aspects of wellness. Um, and, uh, and then cocktails as well, um, which are obviously have always played an important role in the category. But it's amazing to see how much they've had a resurgence post-COVID. Uh, I think yeah. what we're seeing from consumers there is um, people wanting to go out and have a good time and get more dressed yeah. up and more special drinks. And so for us, being able to deliver cocktails without compromise on quality or compromise on margin in different ways is uh, a really big driver. 
Uh, we, I got to see you speak at the Market Leadership Masterclass. And one of the things, because obviously you talked a lot about leadership, we've talked a bit about it here today, but one of the things you talked about at that was the importance of knowing how to go up and down in terms of, you know, as a leader and, and managing that. How, how have you approached that? And what advice do you have for people on that? Um, uh, up and down and across, I think, is really important. Of course, you've always got to be listening to what the MD is saying and the, the senior people. And, and I know that sounds obvious. Sometimes marketers aren't always doing that. They, they can be sometimes operating in their own world. Thomas Barter, from, uh, who works on the Marketing Leadership Masterclass, has this great expression of the V zone, meaning the value zone, yeah. where the CEO's priorities and the marketing director's priorities overlap. And that's so true. Um, but there's so much that you can learn from listening to the most junior people as well. Um, either because they'll, they'll tell you truths that you won't hear from other people. They'll have a different yes. perspective. Um, and I find that also often when I go around the world and I spend time visiting pubs with frontline salespeople, you again, you hear different narratives from them. And one of the things that you're listening for is, does this person, is is the marketer's narrative reaching this person? Does it make sense to them? Because right. the best marketing strategies are owned and understood uh, by everyone in the business because they're so simple to understand. Yeah. And then this aspect of going across as well, um, because the finance director, the supply director, the corporate relations director, all of those have a role to play in your brand being successful. And understanding what it is that's going to get your brand into their priorities or what it, what it needs to deliver for them is also important. And I think this comes back to a principle for me of um, you've got to lead the business. Um, it's back to that, that point we were talking about on Dweeb of marketing is a driver of growth and profit. Um, and I always remember uh, so many of my, <laughs> my learnings involve Sil Sala. I was one of her friends who I met but really early on in my career. One of her friends said about her, she's the only marketer I've worked with who's interested in growing profit. And I thought that was a bit okay. weird at the time because you yeah, yeah. all want to make money. Um, but I realized, I suppose, when I put that into my own self, when I was starting out in my first few years, I was judging myself by, are we selling enough cases? Are we shifting enough volume? particularly this time of year. I remember looking at the daily sales tracker coming to Christmas thinking, you know, we need to sell more cases. Um, and then as I got a little bit more senior, I realized it wasn't the cases, it was the revenue that mattered. Um, and then gradually, I think as I've got into more senior roles, I've worked down the p and um, so that as I've taken up a couple of board positions, you then start going really down the p and to the balance sheet and so on. And all of that gives you this bigger perspective of what, what matters for the business ultimately. Um, and therefore, one of the things I'd say to young marketers is don't take as long as I did to figure that out and go down the P&L. Start off looking further down the P&L and think about, are, are the marketing choices that I'm making going to be driving profits? Um, and also driving, getting more drinks in consumers' hands matters. Um, uh, uh, sales matter. But ultimately, is this going to be driving more profit as well? Because that's what gives you the greatest power as a, a marketing leader in the organization if you can credibly show a path to profitable growth. That, that's wonderful advice. And it's, it's, you know, thinking commercially and not just commercially in terms of, you say, this, the sales, but like, that's a great question. Is this going to drive more, more profit? Um, Mark, thank you so much for spending the time with me today. I really appreciate it. I say I thoroughly enjoyed uh, your session on the Marketing Leadership Masterclass with uh, so she's wonderful, oh, isn't she? I mean, God, yeah. <laughs> her and Thomas Barta, wonderful people. And thank you so much for agreeing to do this with me today. It was great, great having you. It's here. a pleasure, Connor. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks a million. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Mark Sands. I said to Mark when we finished that there was easily another two to three hours of recording to do, just about scratch the surface of his wealth of knowledge. I often think when you are listening, you may be thinking, I'm not in Diageo. And yes, there are things that Diageo are blessed to have. But you heard some things that Mark said, like getting out with sales and customers, thinking about getting into the balance sheet, understanding the P&L, how to be curious, 
These are things we can all do, not just if you work in Diageo. As always, don't forget to subscribe to That's What I Call Marketing, wherever you are listening or watching. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a rating. Thanks to The Indie List for sponsoring today's show. Visit theindielist.ie to find out more. If you would like to reach an engaged community of marketing leaders, get in touch with That's What I Call Marketing to discuss sponsorship opportunities.